Hello, welcome back to my network. I'm with Mark Selby, the CEO of Canada Nickel. Mark, good to see you again. Great to see you. Um, for those less familiar with Sorry, just a really quick overview and then maybe a little bit into the cap structure as well. Sure, so uh, Canada Nickel was founded in, in September 2019, uh, privately. Uh, we went public at the end of February, just before COVID hit. Um, you know, we raised $6 million privately uh, at that time. Uh, we started drilling with Hole 5, the Crawford Nickel Sulfide Project. Fast forward three and a half years later, it's the largest sulfide discovery since the early 1970s. Uh, we completed a PEA back in 2021. We're more than a third of the way through the permitting process. And we're on track to deliver a feasibility study uh, later this year, and hopefully with permits by mid-2025, be in production by the end of 2027. Amazing, okay. Um, all right, before we go into the, the thick of it, yeah. um, just run us through your capital structure. Sure. Yeah, sure. So. Uh, again, been very focused on, on keeping it uh, as tight as possible all the way through. You know, so we've again gone, developed what's the largest nickel resource, one of the largest nickel sulfide projects, uh, and today it's sitting at about 140 million uh, share count. Uh, you know, there was a group of about uh, a dozen investors who were involved in founding the company, and none of them are higher than 9.9. .9, but together, you know, we control between 30 and 40 percent of the overall company. Uh, you know, big announcement for us earlier this year was Anglo American coming in for 9.9 percent. So it was great to get that you know cornerstone investor. You know, Anglo American hasn't done a lot of deals in the junior developer space, so to be one of their early deals is a big endorsement. And I think you know, again, among the you know sort of the next generation of nickel projects, you know, that was the first major mining company investment. So you know, again, good. To to get both of those ticks uh, on the story. Good, um, I just want to take a step back because obviously like, you, like I said, uh, we, you haven't been on the show before. So, yep. and I, I, always, I always hear you compare Timmons to the potential next Sudbury. Yep. And I just want to, for, for myself and, and anyone else looking at this, how can you sort of contextualize that? How, what what sure. sort of size is this and what, what's in the ground at the moment? What, what are your aspirations for this to become? Okay, so, um, you know, that's a great question. So. Uh, past life before Canada Nickel, the reason we've been able to take something from fifth drill hole to feasibility study in three and a half years is that our team was involved in a project called Dumont, uh, which is across the border in Quebec. Uh, one of the key learnings from advancing from Dumont was that you know, by the end of, end of the, all the work that we had done, we realized you know, at the end of the day, you know, if you took a look at a map of value per ton in the ore body, and looked at the first derivative geophysics you fly week one of a, uh, of a project, there was a high degree of correlation between those. So, you know, we were, we, we were really able to leverage the fact that the geophysics gives you a lot of insight in the deposit. Uh, in September 2019, when we formed the company, uh, you know, what was available at that time was four drill holes, um, and the, the guy who's now our VPX, Steve Balch, had flown the right geophysics. And so, just looking at the size of the geophysics, I said, yeah, this is going to be a billion and a half to two billion ton deposit. You know, let's form the company uh, and get going. Fast forward a few years later, you know, we're sitting on two billion tons uh, of resource. And, and what's even more exciting, and you know, talking about the district scale potential uh, of Timmins, was a few years ago, uh, Steve basically took the, the provincial, free provincial geophysics data from the province of Ontario, the province of Quebec, merged them together. Uh, our, our old project, Dumont, was sitting across the border in Quebec. We knew there was nothing around it for 40 kilometers or so, because people in the 60s poked all around it. Um, and then we were just curious to see what lit up around Timmins. And what was amazing was when we screened down the, to the intensity that lights up in both those areas, 20 other deposits popped up around Timmins. And so we found some other historical data that really reinforced that we were on the right track. So we did 27 transactions over a few years to put together you know, 20 plus deposits uh, in that area. Um, you're using this geophysical template. We've drilled a half a dozen of them. We're almost at a batting a thousand in terms of we're hitting a, you know, 100%, uh, the right sport analogy. Um, and so, you know, we are quite confident that, you know, the scale of the footprint we have, you know, is, is, is you know, potentially a multiple of Sudbury. Uh, at Crawford, we have one and a half square kilometers of the right geophysical footprint. Um, you know, we've put together over 40 square kilometers of that. At Crawford, we have five million tons of nickel, you know, all, you know, we're not going to, all 42 square kilometers isn't going to hit, but it's not going to take too much of that to get to a number where you could, you know, conceivably see, you know, 30, 40, 50 million tons of nickel, you know, and by reference, Sudbury's total endowment over the lifetime of, of, of Sudbury, you know, was 18 million tons. And, and where would that put you, I guess, comparatively with, I don't know, like Norio score, any of the other really large nickel companies out there? I mean, how, yeah, so trying to compare. Sure. So, so, so 18 million tons, like the entire Sudbury district is the largest sort of single nickel endowment in the history of nickel sulfide deposits. So, you know, we're targeting something larger uh, than that. Um, you know, 
Today, Crawford, just on its own, the single deposit, would be the fifth largest nickel measured and indicated, you know, fifth largest nickel sulfide resource globally. And, you know, we think with a little more drilling, you know, you know could be even larger uh, on its own, you know, as I said, and we think, you know, we're in the process of unlocking multiple Crawfords as we go forward. Good, okay, and, and talk me through how the exploration model works. How are you looking for the next um, Crawfords? And, and I guess, what's the key focus? Of because obviously you're, you're in this, stage at the moment where you've, you've got to progress Crawford, but yep. at the same time, it's, there's, there's more to be found. So how are you allocating time, resources? What, what's the strategy? And capital, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah exactly. which is always the, the critical piece. Yeah, no, that, no, again, another good question. So, so you know, the, the reason the geophysics works is there's a certain amount of magnetite. There's a certain amount of iron in the olivine when it goes through the serpentinization process, and a certain amount of magnetite shows up in the, in the, in the final, uh, in the, in the final material that we're looking for. So again, we've been using the geophysical data, we fly our own geophysics in addition, you know, to really zero in on the right areas. Um, you know, right now we're not getting full value for the first two billion tons we drilled off at of Crawford. So, you know, what we're not focused on is, you know, adding another billion tons of resource. But what we would like to do and what we think adds value to the story is, you know, when you look at companies that end up in a hostile takeover scenario, you know, you basically fall kind of into, into two buckets. You know, you see companies that are effectively single asset companies get taken out for, you know, 0.8 to one times nav of, of the single project. You know, if you, uh, you know, then you see scenarios where, you know, there's a huge amount of exploration potential in addition to the base project. And you, and you can see valuations, you know, head north to 1.2 or 1.5 times the project nav. So again, because these are large disseminated ore bodies, because the geophysics really does help you target where you're drilling, we're able to do very wide space, like 400 meter drilling, that you know, with a handful of drill holes, really delineate you know some potentially much larger resource. So what we've been doing is stepping around the various targets to to do that wide space drilling to be able to say, okay, it's not only a geophysical target, but we've hit the right kind of mineralization that we want to show up, so that if if we do get in that scenario, you know, we're ready for it. So and we've had great success. I guess before. if you are in that scenario, um, one of the things that would well, one of the things I guess with Project Nav is I think your MPV is around 1.2 billion. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's a pretty good Nav. Um, yeah. And then I, I guess what investors would want to know as well is how protected are you if there is a hostile bid? What, right. What, what position are you in to, to fend that off? And because I, I, we've spoken before, and it, you, you always make clear that you want to build this thing, right? So yes. Yeah. No. No. I mean, again, we'll we'll do you know whatever the market says you know is going to allow us to do and is the right thing uh, for shareholders. Um, you know, the, the key thing is we don't necessarily want to get bought out cheaply. Exactly. So, you know, I think, you know, for us right now, we've got the 9% stake with, with Anglo-American. As I said, we've got that core group of shareholders that owns 30 to 40% of the share price. So, so I think, you know, there's, a, there's enough there that would make people pause to try and, you know, to, to roll a low ball bid in. Yep. So, um, but, but as I said, you know, the, the, best, the, be, the best offense is a good defense. You know, so, so by, you know, building the case, you know, for much, much, much larger value. And again, it also sets the stage, again, in a worst case scenario, where somebody comes over the top, it's like, okay, you can have Crawford, but we're going to spin out the rest of these assets unless you're going to pay up for them. So, yeah. you know, and, and we think there's more Crawfords, and to be honest, we even think uh, Crawford's going to be the first project. Um, you know, based on what we've seen, I think most of the people on our team think we're going to end up with a better Crawford somewhere along the line, so. Good, okay, so you almost want to get in a scenario where you'd almost be too expensive to buy out, essentially. Exactly. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay, so moving on, uh, obviously, clean energy and clean storage um, is something that you've been driving quite a lot at the moment. I just saw the report you released recently that says that you could capture 7% of Canada's carbon emissions through Crawford or yeah. in, in itself. And run us through that. What, what's the aspirations there? What, what's the ideas behind it? Sure, so it's actually 7%. The, the government in introduced carbon capture and storage tax credit, um, and they've set a goal of removing 15 million tons per annum of, of CO2. Um, our, our project, with the technology that we've developed in the last year, takes advantage of the fact that these deposits are hosted in rocks that have this great property that they spontaneously absorb CO2. So we're just taking advantage of that property by the fact that we've ground it all up to get the nickel and cobalt and iron and chrome out, and then we inject CO2 in before we send it out to the tailings pond. And in a relatively short period of time, about six hours of processing, we can we can ha store a million tons of CO2 per annum, which you know would be you know one of Canada's largest 
uh, you know, carbon storage facilities. So, you know, in, in today's world, you know, where people are so focused, you know, on that particular dimension, you know, th that's what really makes, I would encourage investors to look at this entire class of nickel deposits, these ultramafic nickel deposits, you know, as, as you know, we believe are really going to be the next, next big source of nickel because you can develop them with a low carbon footprint and have this you know added uh, you know carbon storage benefit on carbon capture on top. And, and talk to me. So obviously you've got you've got the carbon storage aspect, yeah. which in itself I think is pretty remarkable. I mean a lot of mining companies have a real issue trying to keep their emissions lower yeah. and, and adhere to, to the new SG, ESG standards. So you've ticked a box there. But in terms of actual energy for the projects as well, how, how does that look like? Where, where can you? Be sourcing that energy. Yeah, so we're we're really fortunate in Ontario, and, and it's sort of a key dimension of the project is, you know, most of the grid electricity in Ontario is either from hydroelectric or nuclear. So we have a low carbon uh, electricity source to start with. Uh, we designed the mine to use trolley trucks um, and electric rope shovels uh, to maximize the use of that low carbon power. So that's a big advantage. The other big plus of where we are, you know, this deposit is not in a remote location that's going to have a fly in fly out operation. You know, we're literally 15 kilometers from the end of a rail line that we can extend into the property. We have major highways nearby. So, you know, in terms of transporting, you know, all the materials in and out to, you know, to build a mine, which again, you know, ends up adding a lot to the uh, carbon footprint of an operation. You know, we've got all those inherent advantages that we're, you know, fortunate to have and, and we're, you know, we, you know, we've engineered into our feasibility study. Okay, well, that's really interesting, obviously, with the carbon credit that obviously there's government funding there possibly for that. Um, I, that's not the only source of government funding though, is there? Because there are some, obviously there was an announcement a few months ago that I think the market actually avoided, or not avoided, but didn't really take into consideration, which could have huge impacts on your OPEX in particular. Could yeah. you just run us through that? Yeah, yes, for sure. So in, in the March 2022 budget, you know, the government came up with these carbon capture and storage refundable tax credits. And the great thing with that is we spend the money on carbon storage, we get, we get the money back uh, from that. In this, in this March 23 budget, which again, a lot of investors may, may not have paid any attention to because the reaction in the stock market was absolutely zero. Well, also, with the, there was the Credit Suisse um, crisis going on as well, and yes. the banking crisis. So, oh yeah, so you yeah there was, there was some noise it. in yeah. the background, no, yeah. no, for sure. And so, uh, what, what the Canadian government put in place is a 30% refundable tax credit on all investment in mining and processing you know, of critical minerals. You know, for us, that's basically you know somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of the capital for our project that's going to come from free money from one program from the government. You know, and and when you realize that you know in terms of building a project, 40 it's about 40 percent that you need to raise typically as equity to fund the project. So, so just that one federal government program alone of free government money basically provides almost half of our equity capital. Then the Canadian government has also, they have something called the Strategic Innovation Fund that can also you know, provide equity funding. Uh, then they also have established a critical minerals infrastructure fund. So you know, perhaps some of the infrastructure components of our project you know, could attract you know, funding, uh, again, grant funding specifically for that. Um, so you know, it's, it's between what's happening with the Canadian government you know, there's a number of one-off programs that the Ontario government has done to car companies, battery companies, cathode makers. You know, it'd be disappointing if they didn't end up uh, providing some funding for the miners. And you have the U.S. government basically providing a whole series of funding. I was invited, um, you know, with a group of half a dozen mining projects to sit down with senior U.S. administration officials from the, the Treasury Department, State Department, National Security Council, uh, so give you some sense of you know what the importance is you know for the U.S. government as well. So you know it's quite easy to construct a scenario. You don't have to leap too far you know to see a place where you know half to two thirds of, of the equity required to build a project of our scale could come from various government sources. Then when you you know top in the fact that you know the car companies and the battery companies you know with GM's deal with Thacker Pass uh, for lithium, you know you're seeing funding directly from them as well. So you know it, the the exciting opportunity for us is you know to be able to, you know to get to a point where you can build a project without having to come back to the markets to do to do an equity raise. You know is very exciting and again should get people you know involved. You know to your point early on you know about the opportunity you may have missed it. You know, effectively right now, we're trading at a massive discount to the free check that's st stuck to the front of our project. Good, um, run me through just as we close this off, I'm, what does the next 12 months look like? We're, say we're sitting here next time, yep. next year in Quebec City. Yep. Um, 
what what would you like to be able to say and that we've, we've achieved over the last 12 months? Sure, so you know, 2023 has been off to a good start. We had the, the Anglo-American uh, announcement. Uh, we added Cutfield Freeman as a debt advisor alongside Scotiabank and Deutsche Bank to get the whole project uh, financing uh, package together. Uh, you know, you'll see um, uh, a feasibility study on, on, on uh, Crawford uh, by September. Uh, we've also have a small scale uh, short path to uh, production uh, potential asset with Texmont. Uh, we'll have a resource and a PEA on that out um, later this year as well. Uh, we're looking to have one or more offtake agreements in place with the battery supply chain and car makers. We've been in discussions with them for the last several years and the pace of discussions uh, is increasing. Uh, we'll have impact benefit agreements in place by the time you know, we sit down next year and you know, uh, by first half next year, we'll be looking to file our environmental impact statement, which would then complete the second stage of three stages with the federal permitting process and we'd be a year away from a construction decision on the project. So, Busy year. Yep, Good. very much so. Mark, thank you. No, thank you.